Kannike. Uh, I think my pronunciation is right. Kannada TV serial 2007 May to 2018 June. Uh, it's uh, about over 270 episodes. Du uh, Dusra Hindi 2005 directed by Anand Subramanian wrote dialogue in Dekhni and played a female lead. Devi Ahilya Bai Hindi 2002 directed by Najkir Padvarthan title role. Kannuru Hegaditi National Award for Best Kannada Film 1999 directed by Girish Karnat in Red Roll. Associate Director, Two Streams Media Productions, produced 250 episodes for an award-winning series in Canada. It was from 2001 to 2003. In theater, practice from 1992 till present, over uh, 50 productions and uh, recent highlights. Design, directed, co-wrote uh, co and performed Hidden in Plain Sight, Digital Edition, April 2021. Produced Ultimate Kurukshetra, performed at Kala Ulsav, Explorer in Bangalore to packed houses, rolling into production of Vanguard, a work of historical fiction based on archival research set in the events leading up to and after the Battle of Pollilur in 1780. Mall World painted, uh, painted a 54 foot high mural on artificial climbing wall inside a mall to create a site specific performance. It was in 2014. Device a solo performance hidden in plain sight at uh, Adishakti Laboratory for Theatre Arts Research, Pondicherry, and Goldsmith College with voice as uh, dramaturgical driver. She achieved many awards and fellowships in her credits, like a uh, fellowship of Bren Center for Arts, scholarship of Fitzmaurice Institute, Charles Wallace India Trust Scholarship, uh, Scholars Research Grant, fellowship of Art Think South Asia, etc. So now I do invite Malia Prasad for the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, just quick check in. Can you all hear me? Yeah, you are audible. Audible. And you can see me as well. Huh? And you can see me because. I'm yeah, yeah, perfect, me. perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this talk. Um, thank you, Maya, for suggesting my name, and thank you, Sunit, for taking it up and bringing me to this space. I have actually been listening to all the lectures that have happened on the 15th and I've found them extremely interesting. Um, I just, uh, um, I'm very happy to be part of this um, process of learning um, that continues even though we have been pushed into this kind of extremely um, difficult situation as far as training and learning goes. So, uh, thank you all and thank you for signing in and listening in today. Uh, I want to start with a small little story uh, about uh, um, my experience as someone who went to train in performance making. Uh, let me start by saying that I came across this uh, category of training for the first time in the UK Academy. I had not, uh, sorry, is, uh, are you not able to hear me? Is it not audible? My volume is low, you're saying? No, you're audible. Audible. Um, audible. Yeah, audible, audible, audible. Feeble, is it? Okay. Is this better? Actually, I'm not very familiar with um, <clears throat> with Google Meet, so I'm just checking my settings to see if the volume is better now. Is this better? No. Okay, hang on a second. Hang on a second. Yeah. Is this better now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, as I said, I'm not familiar with Google Meet. I'm more used to Zoom meetings. So I don't know where all the settings are. Okay. So uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I want to start off with uh, telling you a little bit about my experience as uh, someone who went to train in performance making and uh, that I came across this phrase for the first time in the UK Academy. Uh, I don't know where it, when it um, sort of 
uh, comes into use in India. So I'm going to leave that open. But the experience is this one. So as part of my thesis, I was making a performance and um, um, uh, it, it's now nine years that I have been working on that particular project and it has uh, you know, taken many shapes. At that moment, I was looking to create a persona, a kind of a female fool that um, um, uh, sort of init begins begins the performance, a kind of sutradhar, if you will. Okay, but someone who sort of transgresses this space between the performer and the audience, so somewhat uh, going into a personal space of the audience. So that's the kind of persona I was trying to work on, and. Uh, I was looking at uh, this uh, uh, German punk rocker, you know, uh, the, she's actually from East Germany, erstwhile East Germany, and her name is Nina Hagen. I was looking at her, you know, get up, I was looking at her hairstyle, I was looking at all of these things, and I was uh, creating this persona. And of course, whatever happened, the show went off very well, and, you know, it was received quite, uh, you know, well by the students and the faculty. But my very traditional English professor came back to me and she said, is this traditional Kathakali makeup you're wearing? And I remember being completely surprised as to how she came to that conclusion, you know, how she arrived at that conclusion. So um, <laughs> in some ways, I think I felt a little bit of that yesterday as I was listening to Dr. Shibu's lecture and at the end, somebody introduced me as a Bollywood actress. And I was wondering how that connection had been made and how I had been, you know, uh, how that conclusion had been arrived at. And I found that quite funny and I thought I'd start with that. So uh, one of the things that I feel um, as performance makers, uh, what um, happens often uh, is that one is making new performances uh, and uh, one is, you know, pushing the boundaries, uh, challenging status quo, uh, breaking structures in some ways it's quite anarchical no so it can be unfamiliar right so um when it is read it can be read in very many surprising ways your intention may be something and it can be read in many different ways and this happens also with new writing you know because it's uh, it tends to enter the space of the unfamiliar and most times when that happens one is trying to pull it towards what is familiar you know, so that kind of reading, uh, uh, I would sort of like offer it to all you performance makers that be open to that. And uh, it's easier to say, yes, I am that and own it and say, and there is something more uh, to allow for possibility of reading, you know, of how uh, that new material may be read. Okay, so uh, having said that, I just want to sort of move very um, uh, you, you know, I, I, I want to say that I'm really appreciative of the talk yesterday that uh, uh, Dr. Shibu gave and, you know, um, the wonderful way in which he um, sort of drew uh, uh, separation and also overlaps between theater and uh, performance making. I, I really appreciate that. So I won't be saying too much about um uh, you know, performance making itself, because I think um, you may have uh, understood it in great detail and it was also explained really nicely yesterday. So I'm going to dive straight in into voice work uh, and focus today's talk entirely on voice work and how it relates back to, to performance making. Okay. So um, I, when I, uh, as I start, the thing I want to uh, start with is perhaps what voice work is not, or rather what uh, is a very small part of voice work, okay? So uh, when you think about voice work or voice training, whether you're in a, a drama school, school setting where you're you know, learning your craft or whatever, the, the training tends to focus quite strongly on the pathology of voice, meaning that there is something wrong with it and that it has to be fixed. And this can be any number of things. It can be, um, what, what shall I say? It can be uh, your accent. It can be. Audio is dropped. Yes. Audio is dropped. 
is it still dropping no 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 it's fine it's fine no 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 it's fine it's fine fine fine, it's fine. fine. I, okay so fine, please fine, fine. yeah okay so uh, keep giving me that feedback if the volume is going up or down you can always tell me and i'll see if i can check, correct it from my end yeah so um so the training tends to focus on uh, you know pronunciation diction accent and you know many of these things and sometimes I, i i i try to stop myself but i can't help it i believe that this is a kind of a relic of some victorian age you know and it needs to be dropped off as soon as we can in training yeah so the vo- uh, so having said that of course there is some value to it and you know we are wanting to um, hear the actor or the performer clearly and the need the focus of voice work really needs to be uh, clarity of communication and a kind of human connection if that's possible you know so one is really trying to at least get that basic minimum thing and that may have to do a lot more with organizing of one's thoughts than actually just saying the words in a way that is ideal okay if that makes sense so uh, having said that that is a very very small part of voice work so i'll get quickly to what is the exciting part and what um i want to share with you is the space of voice work okay so um to to start out i'm going to put a question out in the room okay so it's very common that you will hear uh people saying that um about the uniqueness of somebody's style okay whether it's a writer whether it is a poet or whether it's a painter you'll say this is the artist's voice do you think that's a coincidence okay just sit with that for a little while uh can you still hear me i'm still seeing some messages that saying that i can't hear you so ma'am you are audible yes, 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 yes ma'am ma'am you are audible yes you are audible okay okay so i ignore the messages okay thank you very much okay okay fantastic so um uh so that that uh, question that i put out there is somewhat rhetorical i mean uh, the answer is uh it's not coincidental <laughs> okay uh, obviously so uh, let me explain why i say that to begin with i mean some of you may know this some of you may not know this but i'll say it anyway so the human voice is so unique that no one ever in the history of time before you or ever in the history of time after you is going to have the exact same voice as yours your voice is absolutely that unique it's almost as if your it's your blueprint or your uh, you know if you did a retinal scan you'd be recognized and uh, you know your your fingerprints or your dna whatever so it is that unique to you okay so uh, that is the first aspect about voice just and i hear i'm only talking about physical human voice okay right and then the next thing that i will say to you is also probably something that you already know is that voice is nothing more than sounding breath okay so there's a very small percentage of languages which rely on clicks and you know in breaths and so on most of spoken language is really just sounding exhalation so as you breathe out that breath sort of vibrates at your vocal folds and sound is produced and that's how you are uh, uh, that's how your voice is produced okay so it is actually just sounding breath and if we go by that logic and we understand um, uh, or rather let me uh, place here that your breath is affected by everything that happens to you every experience everything that happens in your internal environment everything that happens to you in your external um uh, reality everything is affecting your breathing at all times okay so by virtue of that everything that is part of human experience and consciousness affects voice okay so uh that's the second thing i want to tell you about the human voice and the third uh is that the human voice is a very interesting thing did you, did you know that in when you study anatomy or when you go to study to be a doctor there are several systems 
by which you know the body is explained right there's the digestive system there's the respiratory there's your skeleton system and there's your muscular system but there is no such thing as your vocal system there's no such thing there's there's no uh, system that is taught as part of anatomy that is called the vocal system okay the vocal system actually sits across literally several if not all your systems all your uh, bodily functions are responsible in the production of voice it's very interesting this idea okay so the the most interesting part about this the, uh, the fact that i want to focus on is that your voice sits between or rather across your autonomic nervous system and your central nervous system okay by that i mean your autonomic nervous system is things that happen without your uh, you know having to ask uh, send the signals and what happens as part of your central nervous system as you know is what you do consciously right so your voice actually sits across both of these let me give you give you a very rudimentary example of that so when something happens to you that is surprising either it is of great joy or it may be of great grief or it may be a surprise that you may get a sound sort of is comes out as part of a reflexive action okay so that is a kind of primal sound that we make hmm? this sits in your autonomic part of your nervous system okay while when we speak when we make language or sing this is part of a central nervous system activity which means you consciously autonomously choose to speak which means you will breathe in a different way and you will hold the exhalations in such a way so that you can either complete a thought make a demand that wants a response so you will do all of these things very very consciously so that's part that's how it sits across both your autonomic nervous system and your central nervous system okay okay so the the fourth thing that i want to tell you about the human voice is that the voice is not possible unless it integrates with three um three aspects of our being okay one is the body the second is the breath and the third is the imagination it's only when these three integrate together that you have voice okay so that is the physical human voice okay and now here is where i want to sort of like lay out for you very very broadly um uh, the field of voice or voice work okay now there it's wide open field it's so wide that it encompasses or it or it or it includes culture your body your history your gender your politics uh, society what is acceptable in your society what is your family what is what is your environment what is taboo everything <laughs> okay so when the field is that wide and open how then do you begin to make sense of voice work in the um, with respect to performance and performance making okay it is such a wide field everything that is to do with human consciousness as i said and human experience is voice right so how then does one bring it back to performance making so here i go back to some of those very basic principles or rather the three faculties that we have at our disposal for performance making yeah and those three uh self faculties i call them faculties because you know it it can be embodied in a single person or uh, a, a you know a, a group of people and so on so um the body space and text so these are the it's a kind of a rubric that we have for performance making right so let's say these are the three um, entry points into performance making so you can start at any of these nodes you can use any of these three as triggers for performance making yeah so let's say let's take an example a little uh, very simple examples so if you think about the body then quite often we talk about um, a gesture or a movement and sometimes a form being the trigger for investigation for the place where you begin a questioning and that can be the trigger for your performance making right 
So when you think about space, very many times it happens that there is a space. Now your site specific performances are very much about space, right? So uh, uh, it could it could also be that. Uh, it, it, so basically, you know, it, sometimes the performance is relevant inside a university con context, and it may not be as relevant when you take it somewhere else. So space becomes. Um, uh, sometimes even the fact that, you know, some politics that is relevant in one place may not be relevant or may, may have a different connotation in some other space, so on. So space becomes the trigger in some ways, yeah? And text, as you know, many people have talked about this already. So it can be like a base or a something that is uh, that inspires you to create performance or something that you can adapt to take it to, to uh, you know, to take you in a particular direction and so on. So. So we know that there are these three um, sort of faculties that are available to us, yeah? And, uh, uh, you know, sometimes people use music as text as the trigger that sends them off on a journey and so on, yeah? So, uh, so far, uh, you will imagine, uh, you will probably agree with me uh, that voice is necessarily seen as a delivery system. You know, it's uh, well when the conception of of a performance is um, uh, is being made, or when you're you know sort of thinking about performance, voice just is the um, is the way in which it is going to be delivered to the to the audience. It is not necessarily integral to the um, inception or the conception of your performance. Okay, so in this last, uh, I have a few minutes, I think I'll take another 20, 25 minutes to talk about this. So uh, I'm going to uh, sort of take this time to focus on how voice can be the dramaturgical driver to create performance, okay, to be the trigger for your performance making process. So and I'm going to give you some three or four instances where that is possible. Hmm? And of course, uh, you know, there are plenty of other ways. I'm just going to give you these three or four, uh, you know, for, for, for our, uh, you know, discussion. So if you, if you uh, think about, what these four instances may be, the first thing that probably comes to mind is the fact that there is a gap between the written word and the spoken word and that gap itself can become a field of inquiry okay what is written on the page and what happens to that uh, to that meaning as soon as it gets spoken okay so that is uh, possibly an entry space for uh, performance making and uh, um, towards the end of the talk, I'll probably show you some, I'll, I will show you some videos so that uh, from my work so that we can open it out for a little more scrutiny and conversation. Okay, so at the moment, I'm just laying out the instances. The second instance where something like that can happen is, um, <coughs> I'm sorry, it's been raining around here and, you know, I've, um, it's been become very cold. So I have a little bit of a cough. Okay. So the second instance is when you think about voice or sound um, that can create an oratic text, okay? But what, what does that mean really? Oratic means that, of course, it is to do with the audio, but it's also to do with the field of energy that it creates in a specific place. Uh, so, um, how uh, maybe one of the references would be uh, a, a kind of a older uh, uh, essay that was written by someone called Walter Benjamin. It's I think it's called the uh, the work of art in the in the time of mechanical reproduction. I think that's the essay. So uh, in that he he talks about this moment in Paris where. You know there is a um, there is a mass reproduction of art that is going on. So in a nutshell, what he is trying to tell you is that uh, uh, no matter what you do, um, 
the experience that a person has when they walk into say the Sistine Chapel and they look at the painting that Michelangelo has made on the ceiling, that experience, that aura of that experience cannot be replicated no matter what, how good the printout of that particular painting is going to be. So in that sense, if you think about it, the voice uh, or uh, the voice uttered in a particular manner within a specific body in a specific architectural space creates a certain energetic field okay and that is something that could become the uh, that could become a possible trigger okay so i keep saying this because you know i i have uh, um, i also come from a uh, voice training and invariably voice is given this really minor space in actor training you know it's like uh, the 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 major part of training is really about text and imagination and direction and somehow voice is meant only for people who want to uh, you know do clean clean up their tongue or something like that you know so i also come from that space and uh, i know that these ideas may seem um uh as as interesting possibilities for you know exploring uh, a performance so going moving on so there is uh, the oratic text, right? So there is the oratic text that can be a, a, a trigger. So the third uh, thing that I would like to, the third instance that I would like to point out to you is um, is this, this, this notion that, um, uh, I, I, I'll talk about language in a little while, but the thing that I want to actually talk to you about is this instrument that we have, this human instrument. Okay, so I'm going to uh, uh, invite your imagination to think of this human vocal system as a musical instrument. Okay, and um, and maybe draw uh, a parallel and say that uh, just like a musical instrument is mute when it sits by itself, it doesn't play by itself. Something has to be done to it. Yeah. Likewise, uh, the human musical instrument is also like that. You have to do something with it. You have to have an intention to start, um, uh, you know, the process of sound making voice or language or whatever it is that musical instrument will not play on its own. So taking that analogy a little further, one step further, if you imagine a, a drum, okay, so there is a drum that is sitting in, in, the, in the room and you strike the skin of that drum and a sound is produced, right? I mean, then the mechanics of that and the physics of that is not what I want to go into. What I do want to go into, however, is that if you were to place a wet cloth over that drum, it does something different to the sound that is going to come out once you beat that drum again. Okay, once you strike that skin again. So likewise, in voice work, we have something called the monster body. Okay, so the monster body basically means that we have uh, the attempt is to free up the muscular system, the musculature around this sounding, breathing part of the body so that the ease of voice and ease of breath is, is, is efficient and you're able to use the system. Uh, you're able to use your vocal system with a lot more ease and efficiency. Yeah. So likewise, if you were to begin to tighten your muscle in some part of the body, it would alter the breathing and therefore also the voice. Yeah, not just the breathing, but because the shape is being changed by putting a little bit of, you know, uh, tightness in some part of the body, you will begin to change the voice. And this is quite simple. We do this a lot in acting classes. And you will see that a character might emerge, a voice, um, uh, uh, and uh, will uh, there will be an offering of a voice that might then trigger off images and that might trigger, um, you know, your imagination into thinking about a character. Okay, so that is a third way of looking at how voice may be the trigger for something. Mm -hmm. The last one is actually what I want to uh, come to as far as uh, text is concerned. And this is something that comes from uh, many writing exercises. There's a, um, and there's a text written by uh, someone called Castagno. And I think his name is Mike uh, Mac. Uh, one second, let me see. I think I wrote his name down. Um, Mm. Okay, when it comes to me, I will tell you. 
I don't know if it's written here, but it's definitely in a book by uh, someone called Castagno. If you're interested in writing and, uh, you know, lots of writing exercises, then that's a book to go and take a look at. Uh, so there is uh, uh, there is an exercise. It's 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 called the radioactive nature of language. Hmm? So what what uh, uh, that exercise is about is that you take a bunch of nouns and you simply juxtapose them. You just place them next to each other. Okay. Of course, the selection of those nouns is up to the person who's creating. Uh, and as you do that, just by placing those nouns next to each other, you create a, a, a period, a character, a space, a location. Uh, uh, so you begin to sort of use language not in its conventional sense in terms of how it is uh, arranged grammatically for meaning making but actually just by referencing uh, certain nouns that within it has meaning that is larger and it it sort of indic is indicative of of something larger than just that word okay so these are some four instances that i just want to place before you and see that um, say that these uh, these are ways also that I have used in uh, a recent performance that I have made. Um, uh, actually, uh, uh, the performance that I was making uh, took about uh, nine years, you know, to it's still in the making. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a quality of unfinishedness about it um, because one is uh, investigating, you know, it's not about finding a production at the end of it, but rather a curiosity or a questioning that is about actor training, about the actor's craft, about voice work, and how it sort of sits with text and language and all of these things. Yeah. So um, it it started out as as a as a piece that I was trying to make for the thesis in in 2012, and in this moment of um, you know extreme isolation that we've sort of been forced into. Uh, and also because I've been teaching voice work via this Zoom um, situation, um, uh, I came across something very, very interesting. And I, I've sort of tried to use it in the performance. I'll, I'll share that with you also. <coughs> so we've, we've been given this um, in this moment, not that it was not available earlier. It's just that because we had to deal with it so much is this notion of having a camera and a mic at your disposal and that there is a kind of intimacy that is possible um, that I had not explored before. You know, there, there's an intimacy of your voice that is possible that I had not explored before. It makes me think about this, uh, you know, these uh, apps uh, that are very, becoming very, getting a lot of attention, you know, uh, Clubhouse and podcasts and these things, you know, and suddenly there is this moment where listening to the human voice is becoming more and more important, you know, and that that's becoming the way of connecting with one another, even though we are far away from each other, you know, so the, that to me is very interesting. In the early days, you know, in, um, there's a saying in Canada that uh, earlier we used to say that Natka which means basically that I'm going not to watch a play, I'm going to listen to a play. Well, Ata is not a play, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it could be a Yakshagana performance in the field or something like that. So you didn't go to watch so much as much as you went to listen. You know, so I, I just uh, find those things very interesting in this moment in time. And, and I'm hoping that, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I think this may be a good time. I yeah, this may be a good time. I have three clips that I want to show you from a recent, um, you know, um, iteration of an earlier stage performance. Okay, so this is a digital um, version of that performance. The text is somewhat similar. Mm, new text has, of course, emerged. But, uh, you know, the performance itself is completely different. So I'm going to share with you three clips and they're, you, they may be longish clips, they're about two minutes long. And uh, the reason I show them to you is so that we can talk about it. And I want to open this space out for conversation. You know, it's, it's, uh, mm, it's not often that voice work or voice uh, 
as as a dramaturgical driver gets um, uh, a kind of a re look in in um, theater training be it theater training or performance making so you know uh, allow me this uh, moment i'm going to take 2 minutes uh, to show you so so the, the th uh, so uh, could you sandeep if you're there could you play the first clip I sent a letter I sent a letter to my father on the way I dropped it The postman came and picked it up and put it in his pocket 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 po <sighs> Months of planning and it didn't happen Ticket schedule weather <sighs> broke up a home kicked up a job packed in 20 minutes and here I am the long journey along the winding garhwal roads rocks rising up on one side gorge falls off the other side bright pink yellow neon green buildings stick to the other edge they blur by the bank of the icy blue then they fall from view below the river rages on road so narrow the rear view mirror scrapes the guardrail the driver's eyes widen he hopes no one else has seen uh, uh, shall we stop for some photos huh here uh, roads pretty narrow uh, we need to get to gangotri before sunset shiva decided to come along he is taking long leave i think he thinks he's on a holiday <laughs> he's nice as company except when he starts contemplating life thank you thank you ma'am you are on mute so uh, ma'am you are on mute yeah yeah i i caught myself thank you so um there's an instance really of um uh this very topical moment you know where the kind of intimacy that is possible that i can bring an audience so close as to be able to hear my breath and literally bring them into my imagination you know so it's just so close so that's a, an example of that and um uh, you know i'm i'm wondering if i should show you all three clips and okay so uh so i'm i'm open to uh, you know if you have questions about that then uh, you know you you're welcome to uh, drop them in the chat box or just switch on your mic and speak there's one other thing so this piece is really has has got lots of material going on in there so a couple of things that i wanted to work with was this idea of the camera and that only this much is available and that really made me think about kuriyattam and you know and i i remember reading an article written by anmol velani where he says that this is really the scenography and this is all you have so uh, i found that very interesting and i thought you know there was something that um mm, that there was something there to uh, you know uh, investigate as an actor as a performer to see if this is all that is available for performance then you know what can i do with that um so there's uh, there's there's uh, yeah i think i've said enough so if you have any questions about that then i can take those participants can raise their hands so participants can raise their hands so maybe can drop in the chat box in the chat box maybe i can start, maybe I can start. Uh, you uh, mentioned you about, mentioned this, about intimacy. this intimacy 
that uh, you yeah. get that while you, you are in this uh, particular in Zoom mode, the Zoom situation we are in. Uh, but I, I uh, also felt that there is uh, another sort of intimacy that when I'm, I'm born and raised in Delhi, so I, while I used to watch the Imbos Pulsers perform in different situations or different situations, different situations atmosphere. Sandeep, some problem. Sandeep, some problem. Sandeep, yeah, now you yeah. debate. Uh, you debate uh, uh. Now can you hear me? Now can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear yeah. you. Okay. So, okay. Um, so... Uh, I think uh, uh, your two devices are two on. Mic, mic, mic of your two devices. You have to mute one. You have to mute one. Okay. Okay. Oh, I have. No. No, I, I think, yeah, now it's fine, I think. Okay, so uh, so while I used to watch uh, Tayyam performances in Delhi in, different, in a different atmosphere rather than one in Kerala, uh, there was another sort of, I used to feel distanced from that art form because maybe not not even TM in Yakshagana when I used to watch Yakshagana in the you know uh, uh, coastal areas in Karnataka the voice uh, interacts with the atmosphere the way they they sing that that voice you know interacts with the landscape so even when the TM the drums while they are performed it echoes back from the you know at the nearby villages so there's a different sort of uh, feel to that sound uh, when I hear the same thing recorded and produces audio not a sound I get a different sort of intimacy. So, what is your uh, you know view about that thing, that feel which I get? You know, these two different feels which I get in different situations. Yeah, so they are different. Actually, there is a, there is a very simple uh, thing that I was trying to do. You know, because I am forced into using earphones and I'm forced into using a microphone in this moment. Okay, and that is the that is the thing that I was sort of like trying to see how can I continue to um, be in this digital space and still find a way to be really close and really intimate with an audience. You know, the, what you're talking about is, of course, part of, uh, you know, the kind of experience one has in a landscape and, you know, with other people in the space. So that's the. Uh, this this is a uh, this is something that one is very familiar with you know that is not uh, uh, and one doesn't want to in any way say that you know this is in any way better off or worse off it's just that uh, to think about it as when a kind of technological um, um, challenge is thrown at us one can choose to work with it or one can choose to disregard it it's a it's a it's about autonomy, you know, it's about, so do I feel like my performance is being, um, how shall I say, uh, hijacked by technology? Or am I able to um, do something with it that uh, brings me, that keeps the connection between me and my audience? So that is the space I'm in. The fact that my voice can go directly into somebody's ears, you know, in this moment. It's not something that I would have even thought of uh, trying if we were not, you know, stuck in this pandemic situation, right? So, does that make sense, Sandeep? Yes. It Was does. that Sandeep yes, who asked me the question? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. 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 So, yeah. So, can I ask you to please uh, play the second clip so that, in the interest of time, I'm not um, going over. There is so a question in the chat box. Question in the chat box. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Shall I read for you? How can Shall I? I read for okay, you? Yeah, no, I can read. Okay, yeah. So I'll just read it out loud. It says, "How can I simply sharpen my voice?" Uh, there you go. So that is; those are the kinds of questions that are interesting. I mean, you know, you want to do something with your voice. It is absolutely uh, um, a, a valid thing to ask for. But um, I would, I would ask you to also begin to explore. What is it that is that makes you feel the voice is not sharp? Because I have not heard your voice in the first place. But there is seems to be some kind of, um, how shall I say, a, a, a kind of judgment on your voice that you already have. And I would I would be very curious to find out as to where that comes from. You know, uh, uh, just like our um, outward appearance, right? Um, what we call, um, you know, body. Uh, image that we have we also have a voice image and it comes a lot from how uh, we've what we've been taught about what is 
the right kind of voice what is a good voice and what is not a good voice and what is when it is a bass voice it is uh, you know so there is so many things that is attached to voice right and uh, um so it's it's interesting that it's a question that probably i would sort of urge you towards is to ask yourself as to where that question comes from you know do you, do you understand what i'm saying um <laughs> it's difficult to talk to a text <laughs> a piece of text that is on the chat box but if you can respond and say something to me uh, if if what i'm saying is making sense to you so where does this question arise from whether you know well so i t i talked about the pathology that is <coughs> that surrounds voice no that something is wrong with it and i need to fix it somebody that that notion comes from somewhere and you need to begin to investigate that yeah thank you how does one engage with different resonators while working with emotional quality and character work okay so these are uh, these are very specific questions regarding voice uh, training and uh, i'm happy to take them i think you know there's one, something very wonderful that uh, venu ji said in one of his um, uh, navarasa sadhana uh, workshops you know he said voice is not possible without emotion it's just not possible and i agree with him you know because if there is breath and body and imagination involved and they are integrated to make sound then it cannot be separated there there's no uh, there's no se separation between the, the between the two how do you engage different resonator see uh, uh, different resonators in the body can be engaged by understanding what those resonators are and what you need to do to be able to feel the resonance in your body and resonance is something that you can grow it you can cultivate it in the body and we can continue talking about craft yeah shall we move on mm, uh, how do we make sound <laughs> sound modulation for different characters yes that's a wonderful question i i will take that question then at some point yeah, just give me a moment let me just uh, conclude the talk and then we will take those craft questions in a bit um yeah may i ask sandeep to play the second clip please alas woman alas woman i knew her. i knew her. a damsel of infinite zest butterfly life of the party bees knees exotic cheese the soft melting center of chocolate lollipop and then godrej mixer grinder with seven types of different blades galvanator fridge with sky blue door special ice tray hawkins pressure cooker with three year guarantee maiso sandal soap nice and prickly heat powder when did you stop drinking rubs outside the puja room during power cuts when was the last time you ran in the rain why did you stop making shapes with your breath on the mirror riding in cable cars in china silk sari japan love in tokyo i'm sorry mitto i didn't have the courage within a mannequin to just pack my bags and fly off to far off shores and send postcards from japan up in tokyo so so that's an instance where you know one is referencing certain things to create a nostalgic sort of uh, uh, reference 
to what is the reality that that particular character is coming from you know so uh, i'm i'm just going to see if there is any uh, curiosity or questions about that um, about language about words being something that um, you know being uh, some kind of base for performance so any questions there and we can we can take that and if there is it, then that, yes it's not about this what it's not about this what like a talk in general talk in general uh because in the uh, beginning you mentioned the beginning you mentioned that voice, voice was used as an exercise as an exercise like in the over like scenario the over scenario of break or something and from there we have come today we have come to in the pandemic situation we have come to a place where voice is all what we, what we have like so there is a paradigm shift in the in the no you also mentioned about clubhouse and you know the, the act of listening so there is this uh, you know par, uh, pandemic sorry uh, there is this paradigm shift in the, in the focus of you know uh, voice uh, in that sense so like so the, the philosophy has changed over uh, you know these two uh, scenarios so can, how do you see this uh, can you can you just say the philosophy you know how do you as 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 a, some, somebody who has been using this uh, mo, uh, medium so much so how do you uh, see this so uh, uh, i'm not sure if i understood your question properly sita so may i um, may i ask for a little bit of clarification please uh, when you yes, say Okay, of course. Of course. Uh, can, yeah. yeah. Can you please? Because, can you ask uh, me that because, because in, the, in, the, in the, yeah. for example, yeah. in a theater workshop, uh, the voice modulation is being used as a break, as as a form of exercise. Or I know you you said it in the beginning uh, with that same smile. You said <laughs> that it's just used as a break, as, as something that you know, as an interlude or something like that. So from there. like today in the, the pandemic scenario you you depend so much on listening so like you no know, so that the so with the technological shift so in the in the uh, like what you say in the physical from the physical space to technological space there is this paradigm shift so is that is that okay so couple of things there uh, sita you asked uh, some things there let me see if i can sort through them okay one the, the, the or let me let me see if i can address them all if i can i will if not you know i will leave it open as a as something that is there for us to think about so the first thing is that uh, this notion of uh, modulation is also very much part of uh, actor training you know it's 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 uh, uh it's 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 a it's a non category actually you know you cannot teach somebody how to modulate their voice you know modulation happens depending upon what you are trying to say how urgent is your need to say it you know it uh, th that is what makes your voice ri rise and fall you know and basically modulation simply means the rising and falling the cadence of your voice and that changes depending upon the content the urgency or what you want from it how you want to uh, put your voice to use to make it do the things you want it to do so that's what makes the voice uh, change so it's not something that you can take from outside and put it on to voice it's completely meaningless then you know see for example if i have to say ah oh, the weather my name is malika and therefore where have you been if i say that i can do that but you see it is just meaningless that so this category of teaching modulation first of all should be put in the bin very quickly so that is <laughs> that is something i want to say the second thing i want to is probably um uh, maybe uh, this may be uh, uh, see uh when we work with the human voice the the project of it what is it is is actually some kind of connection you know some kind of commun meaningful communication that's happening between individuals it's not in a void okay whether it is in a physical space or whether it is in this distanced kind of space it still has to come with that basic intention that i want to connect with you i want to make sense to you i want to be heard i want to be understood 
you know it has to come from that space so whether it is in a physical space or whether it is in this digital medium that true reality is not is not changing too much you know because that's the you know when you say what is the truth of the moment when we say which is the active pursuit of an actor right so the truth of the moment is the it's, it's even in this moment i want to be understood by you you know and that is what probably we refer to as a, as an authentic or i mean not that you know there is such a thing as an inauthentic voice but nonetheless the one wants to say that the intention when it carries from you and it connects and uh, in with another human being then you know that is that is the purpose of voice you know in this moment we've been forced into this kind of digital medium where we are you know sitting in separate spaces but you know there there have been wonderful connections also that have been possible because of this so each uh, each thing bring with the challenges that it brings it also brings with it um, the excitement of innovation is what i feel that's my thought yeah i hope that uh, yeah, 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 no, yeah 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 no, thank you Oh, uh, you you are on mute. Oh, sorry. Uh, may I ask for the last clip, please? Uh, was there a hand that went? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone raised the hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone raised the hand. Okay, I can take that question and then we can take the last clip. <coughs> I think the person uh, lowered the hand. Lowered the hand. Okay. So maybe right. we can then we can move. show. Yeah. We can move. Yeah. Yes, we can move to the next clip, please. Is that a mud hut? Trees, breeze, hut. my feet wet red clay stream pat pat i feel you ya bathless one ageless one deathless one oh thoughts as nails claw hammer cleave the sarcophagus of sleep yeah thank you for that so that uh, last piece is really uh, something to sort of like maybe tease out um an idea that i was working with in fact uh, i was collaborating with a um a long term i mean you know i've been collaborating with uh, a playwright for over 14 years now so this is um something that we were working on and when i was talking about oratic text we were actually um uh looking at this arrangement of sound which is very apparent in some texts you know which are quite uh, i mean um, how, uh, let, let me explain it in a slightly different ma'am you are on mute yeah yeah have i been speaking all this while on mute no 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 okay okay so uh, this is this piece is something that sort of opens out this idea of the oratic text you know this is something um that uh, i've been um collaborating with a playwright for over 14 years now and this is something that we were very interested in exploring that uh, the a specific arrangement of sound has a has an has an effect in the space in a room uh, in in our bodies as as we speak them and also as the person who's listening to it you know so this um, the idea of the way sound is arranged say in a mantra or or an incantation kind of 
uh, you know, space where, um, um, and, and, and the reason I don't show you a clip is because there is that um, slippage there, you know, because if you were to listen to it, that kind of sound in the space with me, there's a kind of ringing that happens in your voice and in, in your ears as you hear that sound. Something happens to the body as you receive that sound, you know, and there's something that happens to the energy uh, of of the performer as well as the person who's listening. So, uh, and and when and and some some of it is lost in when you uh, pass it through the digital me medium, you know. But that was the exploration really is to um, look at the potency of a particular arrangement of sound, you know. And we were looking at uh, <coughs> a particular goddess and a mantra that is associated, and we were trying to move that sound into text and performance. So so, um, so that is really uh, what I wanted to leave you with and maybe, you know, uh, see if there is some questions uh, going forward. So, so really, um, that's where I want to also close the conversation uh, for today as far as voice work, you know, um, being an open field for exploration and creating performance. So, Thank you very much for listening. And I'm happy to listen to take questions from here on. And those craft questions also can be taken from here on. Thank you. Sir, yes. Prakash, Sir, Prakash, we'd like to ask you to ask you Yeah, ma'am. Uh, yeah, ma uh, yeah. It was interesting to see the last video where uh, actually we were able to see the uh, character which was trying to communicate. And, uh, and the words, what you, the, the concept of the thought, what you put forward as the orality, is it something uh, similar to what we see in the songs of Haivadana written by Girish Karnat? Like uh, the song which has been directed, composed like uh, by Bibi Karant, like Kil Kil Lanta Nakku, Kul Lige Kachagul Hit Hitu. Said about Muridu. Is it something similar to what you are saying? Uh, if so, and uh, that means the language, does language plays a major role, knowing the language plays a major role when we are creating the sounds or the voices through that? Uh, Ma'am, you are on mute. Okay, I keep turning it on mute so that the echo doesn't happen. So I'll I'll try and see if I can leave the mic on. So um, there are three parts to that question, Satya Prakash. Okay, one is, um, is it similar to what uh, Karanji was doing? So uh, Baba Karanji was doing something very interesting. He actually uh, had a, had this amazing thing to say. He said that you know music in uh, in theater is about disharmony. It's not about how melodious you can sound, but what you can actually do in terms of um, uh, uh, breaking melody, you know, for, for, and he, he was one of those great people who brought um, uh, prose and song, or rather how speech and song very close to each other, you know, that is what he was doing. And he, I think um, uh, the strength of uh, uh, my understanding of Karanji's work is really his ability to create music in speech, you know. So that is uh, that is my um, offering to that first part of the question. The second um, is uh, I think what you have asked is uh, uh, sorry I, I I missed that. What is that second part of your question that you had asked? Uh, uh, knowing the language. Knowing the language. Oh yes 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 yes. So knowing the yes yes knowing the language yes of course I mean one wants to work in a language that is of comfort and familiarity and or or one where one feels most um, uh, the most strength in you know I mean it's not you why would you want to work in a language that um, in in some way makes you feel that you're not expressive unless that is the purpose unless that is something that you want to explore you know what is it that how does one feel when one has to one is forced into working in a language that is not of my comfort. So those are, uh, so does it, uh, yes, of course, the, the, the knowledge of language is always useful. But I think what this does is it goes beyond 
that layer of meaning that comes from language and text you know it's sort of like ducks under that to a sound level so it's almost as if there's a layer of meaning that is lying under the text which is which is to do with sound you know um so that's that's uh, that's i think what i want to say about your second part of your question i hope that's that's useful and if if you have something to clarify about it then please do yeah yeah uh, something like uh, something like uh, in the context i was as context i was as when we are taking a class i am from bangalore my native language is language, language is kannada but the medium of education medium of education i would be delivering will be delivering will be in english and uh, yeah i can communicate in english but can i express my thoughts to its complete and if so how to do so i think you got my point i think you got my point yeah satyaprakash this is an age old question you know i i don't know who put it in whose head that you know one thinks in a language one actually thinks in many ways one thinks sensorially one thinks in images one thinks in terms of argument you know so um so uh and i i personally um, i'm of the opinion that we have many languages in us there may be a one language that is of familiarity but uh, you know by virtue of the fact that we all live in somewhat cosmopolitan spaces we have many languages within us you know like for example when you speak of canada canada is not sans english you know it, there is so, um, there's a lot of absorption of english words into canada and that's part of communication and that's the easiest way to communicate so there uh, there, there is uh, i don't see a puritanical way of looking at language that way but but you, it is a qu- good question to ask um as to what is the language in which, which i can most communicate what i'm thinking or what i'm wanting to communicate you know so and that sometimes breaks the unity of a single language uh, many times in my own home i switch between kannada and i sp- switch between kannada and uh, tamil and hindi and english and very fluidly and uh, for us in uh, in india most of us have at least two or three languages in us you know so and one can switch uh, uh, and uh, very rarely uh, are you not understood you know most of this judgment is uh, self imposed that you know what will people think if i move from one language to another or, uh, or whether people will understand or not if they don't understand they'll ask you so this is my my thinking about you know the idea that there is a singular native language that yes there is a mother tongue and there is a language that we are used to and comfortable in or what we speak m- most of the time at home but you know this this um, Mm. for example there are there are no words that can, uh, some words cannot be translated into kannada and some words cannot be translated from kannada into english and though you have and you have to use those words you know and uh, try as ha- as as much as you can as as much as your intention may be to bring the other person as close to that meaning as possible but that's as far as you can go does that make sense yeah yeah Okay. I I was coming to the theater coming to the theater what I was trying to say is like theater practitioners who work in one particular, particular language they often uh, will not be entertained in other languages language. language. okay. and I had always I had always just thinking why is why is that, that? Why is that? and uh, yeah and uh, yeah. something that was you were saying that was really kind of the yeah you used to say uh, if you speak if you should be like a should be like a song and you should sing it should sound like a prose sound like a prose adabre hardange irbeku hardadre hardange that's what he has so given the statement given the statement but still i am coming still, to i am coming to the linguistic linguistic of the theater of the theater why they are they are still they colonized why they come as one and as one and together and together and taking us taking us 
Thank you. Well, it depends Thank on you. which side of the line you are, isn't it, Satya Prakash? I've been um, a person who's been living in Bangalore for uh, all my life. I was born and brought up here. Um, but uh, my parents migrated from Bihar and, um, uh, you know, in 1963, and the language that is spoken between my parents is uh, Bhojpuri and Methali uh, and Maghai, you know. So um, the fact that I speak Kannada and I speak Tamil and I speak, um, you know, I, I understand Telugu is is uh, something that uh, comes from the fact that I've lived in Bangalore. But, you know, the uh, the this notion that, uh, you know, some actors are allowed in English theatre and, and allowed in Kannada or Kannada theatre does not accept people who are from a different language. These are things to do more with chauvinism, isn't it? Isn't it? I mean, I don't know if it is necessarily to do with craft or, uh, you know, um, actually somebody who uh, is a performer or something, somebody has something to say. Um, I started directing uh, plays when I couldn't speak Kannada and I was directing plays at Nina Sam. So, you know, so it it was, uh, to me, it has, uh, it's a question of, uh, uh, I, th I think there's a, there's a, there is a degree of navigation that one has to, um, you know, undertake <laughs> in this terrain where identity can be weaponized against you at any moment, you know, so, and, and this happens uh, on all sides uh, of that line. It's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily depend on which side of the spectrum you, uh, you know. <laughs> so I don't know if, if it's making sense. I think, I think there's a politics, of course, that is, um, uh, that is associated with language and there's, there's identity there that's at the center of it all. But, hmm, sorry. Yeah. 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 Malaga, no problem. If you can mute your mic while others stuff, that will be better. Yeah, thank you. Hello, ma'am. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask something, and I'm uh, not able to make it specific. I'm not able to articulate it in a way. So, just out of your experience, I would like to know that um, since now we are talking about. Uh, empowering our, our voice and making an expression and uh, getting our stories uh, to the audience but uh, I, I would like to know that is it is it uh, possible i mean uh, is there other possibilities if we just uh, keep the silence within us uh, as you say that voice sits in every aspect of being human so uh, is it possible to you know the, all those uh, autonom autonomic and uh, central nervous uh, that stimulation that we have to to retain that within us and does that create uh, uh, does that create other possibilities to happen and uh, does our expression find other ways uh, as the last time also I have uh, in Satya Sar's uh, session there was a, a connection shown between scenic and sonic. So every object and its vibration. Uh, so as a performer, I just want to know out of your experience, since you have been so deeply involved with it. Thank you, Desh, for that question. Thank you, yes, it opens up many, many possibilities. Thank you, um, many, many possibilities there. Um, Yes, I mean, uh, verbal co communication and uh, is, is a very small part of how we communicate with each other. You know, one, one is actually communicating via spines. The intelligence of uh, the human body is such that we give away uh, uh, information about ourselves, even that one, one, information that we may not even be aware that we're doing, that we are giving that information away to be read by others all the time. You know, so um, yes, so absolutely. The the uh, the question that you've asked brings me. I mean, it's sort of like um, makes it invites me to talk about something else, if I may. So one of the uh, you know things to remember when we do voice work is that the better part of uh, voice work is listening, 
and this listening is not just through one sensorial organ which is your he- ears but it's a deep listening it's a listening from within it's a listening using all your sensorial organs so a sense of feeling a sense of sight so each of your sensorial organs have an external recep- reception that uh, let's say the, the a way of receiving the ex- uh, outer world right but the same um, uh, neurons or the same parts of the brain fire even when you imagine it from within okay so even when you imagine you're seeing something or you you know uh, <coughs> uh you remember the smell of something or you remember a sound of something you know so the same sets of uh, same parts of your brain are actually firing at that time so there is a um, quite a uh, quite a you know uh, there's a, there's a, the, the world of voice and the research around voice work has gone quite some distance away and this fact that that uh, that you've brought this up that um you know there is something about vibrations you know there is something about at the end of the day one is actually electromagnetic and simply you know vibrating we are just vibrant beings right so one is constantly sending out um uh, vibrations outwards and is also receiving that and here is the domain of that wonderful thing we call empathy or empathetic listening and it begins with actually beginning to understand your voice from a sensorial perspective how you feel it in the body uh when you make a sound and what is that relationship that you have with your voice which may at the moment be only as to how it sounds to you and when you record it what it sounds to you but rather what is the experience felt when you speak or when you make a sound you know so to to begin to listen in to your voice is what opens you out also to how you listen to other people does that make sense desh uh i mean that's just like yeah, yeah. literally scraping yeah, yeah. the surface of what we want to talk about but uh, yes there is a lot there uh, to explore sir ma'am sorry sorry adesh sorry to interrupt the second part uh, i just want to ask uh, ma'am uh, that is uh, that uh, every time we every time we uh, every time we see the world we listen to the world we make a impression within us about the world uh, either it's uh, through audio through visuals through sensations so is there a meeting point between all these senses and we can just integrate all these things together and find something very integrated rather than differentiating it in a way thank you ma'am yes desh in fact um, that is the field of the work that you're doing it's creative expression um it Supnal, is integrating Supnal... yeah, sorry ma'am continue yeah. Yeah, sorry ma'am continue yeah yeah so the, the, that's what i want to leave you with desh is that uh, this integration of body uh, experience of how we see the world and the impressions it makes on us um is what we make um, you know creative is is how we express ourselves creatively so yes that is the meeting point <laughs> um yeah i hope okay, thank you man thank you says thank you man thank you yeah 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 thank yeah. you man thank you yeah. thank you man thank you very much okay there is a question from so sona bondra how the voice work differs from a theater's perspective and a musician's or singer's perspective so um the each of it is a craft so basically when you are a theater actor um there are certain uh, expectations right of uh, how you use your voice and uh, what is the space in which you are using your voice what is what is the architecture of the space and so on you know one is actually um looking at the craft of um using the voice in a way that is that communicates the reality or the truth of that character in that moment right it's not very dissimilar from what you would do if you were a performer um uh you know in uh, let's say that something that was not theater but singing however um requires um a, a deeper understanding of 
um, you know, pitch, for example, to put, to put it very rudimentally, so there's an understanding that is to do with pitch, that is that has to do with the resonance, that has to do with rhythm, and that has. So the, these are uh, so the training for a singer, the baseline training as far as uh, coming to using your voice in a way that you're not hurting the instrument, you're using your breathing. Uh, and your support system in an efficient manner, that baseline work is actually quite similar for all people who are users of voice. And this is actually useful for even teachers and anybody who you know uses their voice as, as, an influ uh, as something to influence the space that they're in. So uh, that, that baseline understanding of how the voice work remains the same. You know? But as you delve deeper into uh, a specific field, yeah, there, um, you may have to make certain changes in, in terms of how you use your instrument because the intensity with which you use your voice is, is it changes. You know, how you use your voice, then um, uh, it becomes important uh, because at the end of the day, the vocal folds are only so big and that's the size that you're born with and that's the size you will leave the world. Uh, with you know this is, it doesn't change in terms of size so um we and uh, we want to be able to put as little effort on it as possible i was listening to uh uh i think a video recording somewhere about the number of singers who have to go through this process of abuse mm -hmm. surgery recovery and then back to singing and then that cycle repeats. And it comes from not understanding an efficient way of using voice at that kind of intensity. You know? So yes, there is a, there is a, di a difference in terms of um, what will happen in the way you use your voice as the field of work that you're working in changes. So for actors and for singers, there is a very specialized uh, requirement of the voice. Like, for example, if you're a speaker, this is an example that I offer many times. Uh, if you're a speaker and you suddenly feel emotional or afraid or, you know, suddenly tense and your throat closes up, you have this moment where you can stop and you can take a sip of water and then carry on, right? You have this moment to step back. Uh, but many times for an actor, she has to perform in the throes of an emotional state, you know, and that generally has a kind of tightening in the body when you when you're feeling overwhelmed by emotions there's a tightening in the muscles it's, there's a tightening in the body and in that she has to speak she has to continue uh, saying her lines so all of those things so the demand from an actor or a singer as far as the voice is concerned is different so therefore the training also changes does that make sense yes ma'am yes, surely ma thank you surely. so much thank you so much you are so, uh, Manoj Kumar, uh, so uh, Manoj Kumar, uh, can you ask your question? Yes, uh, Malika, can I? Can I ask? Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. I'll, I'll go next. Okay, so if you want, you can ask me. No problem, ma'am. You can go. Okay, ahead. I will ask. Malika, Romba Pramadama over on a Sunday came both the Romba Pramadama voice of the Nerea Vishan Serenjigrade. And I number voice now or Melotama, Melotama, voice now in a pain case home. I mean, Romba Teliva, Romba Armea Pesering, eh? If a Yerka Vulcan area perk Sunday Hungal Katakana, Asailar. So, you have night classes in the classes, you have a lot of classes in the night classes. So, you have a lot of classes in the night classes. So, you have a lot of classes in the night classes. You have a lot of classes in the night classes. So, you have a lot of classes in the night classes. So, you have a lot of classes in the night classes. So, you have a lot of அது வந்து எனக்கு அந்த டைம்ல தேவை ஆனா என் குரல் பாதிக்காத வகையில நான் பண்ணுவேன் ஆனா சில பேர் சொல்வாங்க என்ன வந்து இப்படி பண்ணிக்கிட்டு இருந்தா நீ கூடி சீக்கிரம் தொண்டை போய்டும் அப்படிம்பாங்க உங்களோட அபிப்பிராயம் என்ன நான் 
நீங்க தமிழ்ல நான் இங்கிலீஷ்ல பேசுவேன் பட் ஐ ஹண்டர்ஸ்டூட் um you know use it like that for too long then you will lose your voice so i'm just answering if you know how to do those things if you know how to do those things safely without hurting your own voice then please do go for it there is a certain support system that is available in your body where you can support that voice to be able to reach those uh notes to be able to reach the, the, create those effects with your voice if you know those techniques and you use them um with that knowledge then yes of course please go ahead doing it um but remember that you know um it, 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 that comes from uh, understanding how the support uh, works how you support um, use your muscles to support that kind of uh, you know voice that you're trying to create so yes i mean uh, to answer that question my my opinion is that training i mean the, if you have the training to um you know uh, experiment with the range that the human voice actually has then uh, of course why not so um of course uh, there uh, i i train um, kale has also said that uh, you know just to offer it out i offer a lot of free sessions uh, every sundays because you know voice work Uh, and voice is taught um so basically there are 263 teachers worldwide who teach <laughs> the fitzmaurice voice work and uh, uh there are very few of us who teach um voice in india uh, or anywhere else you know um, so uh, one of the things that uh, the reasons why i offer lots of free classes is to create awareness around the voice it's a, it's something that all of us use and uh, when we when you know it's a great idea to learn something about your own voice so yes um, so that's i i've i've done i've done what kale has asked me to do so yes thank you kale <laughs> thank you we have time for one more you can ask a question ask a question yes sir yes sir the name of the system of the voice yes i'll thank drop you. it in the chat thank box ஒன் <laughs> uh another question uh, sorry query is uh, uh like you have done so much exploration voice work for so, uh, such a long period of time so will you still uh, say that uh, voice serves the text like will is that statement still stand true uh, or or will you say voice can overpower the text and give a different exp- uh, like different uh, way of expression in, in a way yeah i don't know how to word that more in a better way <laughs> yeah okay let me answer that first part of the question first okay so um i think you it would serve you better to instead of thinking in the language like thinking is a bit of a rabbit hole you know so i uh, i always steer away from thinking uh <laughs> something that can be done physically okay so um so you it might serve you better for you to speak in the language that you are working in and to speak it as much as possible it's what children do and most times that's how they learn language you know just just pick up the words that are in their environment and just keep repeating them and somewhere along the way they find connections connecting words the grammar of it emerges you know so it's not kind of like in a straight line so the lots of it um so i would say i would suggest that you know if you're working in a language that is not familiar to you then instead of thinking in the language you actually speak it you use you say it you, you read out loud and all of these things will help you a lot more than thinking it in the, in in uh, thinking it in your head so that's the first part of this question the second is i think uh, what you're asking is uh, uh uh 
does it overpower i don't think it is so, so you know the the whole point of performance making is to um you know um take that hierarchical structure of what is better off and what is worse off that pyramidical structure and drop it on the ground you know and try and see if there is a way in which each of these things informs the other you know so one is actually trying to um 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 I mean, what I was trying to do today was to give you a possible entry into performance making via voice work. Okay, so this performance that I've uh, made recently, uh, it's it's my only uh, solo performance, in fact, but this is in collaboration with the writer. And this has led us to see how this centrality of authorship can be diffused and you know, then, then that we can find a way of not overpowering one another, but actually how can one find a way to take my craft and inform text and how can text then be part of voice work and then how that can go towards creating performance. So really that is that is the endeavor. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, come to the end. Come to of, the end I think we can of, take I one more question. Can take one yeah, I'm okay with that. Uh, I know that you're uh, out of time. Sushma, yeah, take one. Ask your question. Ask your question. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, um, uh, uh, the thing is, what I uh, face, the problem is, um, sometimes we have, uh, uh, the character has a melody, melody voice, or the you know the voice we use uh, during the romantic scenes or something like that so uh, in theater in theater during that kind of scenes uh, they tell me that your voice is not audible to the audience so you know you be a bit loud or something like that when i'm loud enough um, that feel or that uh, you know i i won't get that Actually, my my original voice is, uh, you know, it's it's kind of raw or something like that. When it when it is a uh, uh, you know, come come me jagadali mata adre chana kele sate melody agi loud ag mata adre na nu a a feel barala rude ag mata adre dini anta kele sate so adhiki yen suggestions korte ro. So for all these craft questions, I suggest you come and train. Um, and <laughs> so these questions about uh, uh, the quality of voice, I'm just joking. But what I'm trying to say is that, uh, see, the question you have asked is that when you speak softly and it is an intimate space, there is a certain quality to that voice, right? And the moment you increase the volume, you lose the quality of that intimacy. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Have I understood you correctly? Okay. Yes, yes. So now, yes, yes. so that is that is something that will also naturally happen. Also, no. Like for example, if you're sleeping next to your lover on a pillow, and the quality of voice that is going to come out is going to be um, markedly different from you actually yelling across uh, a window or trying to say the same lines but trying to reach the audience in the uh, you know in the end of the auditorium, right? So, so these are um, these are issues of a couple of things you know so how we understand or how we direct uh, our actors you know when we say that there has to be a certain quality to voice because you're playing a certain type of role these are these are notions that uh, you know in some ways you can negotiate with the director also and have a conversation with them about voice which is which is always a good idea so you can take charge of how you sound and that it's not something that is being asked to be changed simply because it fits a certain kind of, um, uh, I don't know how to say it, but you know, there's a certain conception of what a heroine's voice should be like. Okay, so there are there are there is the politics of that. Let's leave that alone. But let's think about uh, more about how does one think about projection? You know, like how am I going to um, uh, retain this quality, this uh, this um, mm, this intimate quality, but still be heard. You know, some 
30 feet down the uh, down the uh, auditorium or the, uh, the the theater space so those are interesting questions to ask as to what really is projection what does it mean to be able to pro project a slightly lower volume voice uh, and retain all its qualities and still be able to be heard at the end of the um, of the space so um, so um, interestingly that when when you're trying to be heard far away you imagine that if you raise the volume that's how you're going to be heard actually that is not the way to project your voice the way to project your voice is to think about your voice traveling along a line give it direction give it a specific direction and then to understand consonants in your in in your speech consonants and artha vyanjanagal those are the percussive mm -hmm. parts of yeah. your speech when you are able to sound those percussive parts of your speech then you are heard further away even though your volume remains the same your volume and and pitch can remain the same and just these two ideas will help you send your voice further away okay so these are things to learn these are things to do with the craft and you really must train and there you know i i find that um, uh, quick fixes are really a bad way to go as far as the voice is concerned it's really a magical and very very beautiful very delicate system that you have in the body and it's worth knowing a lot more about it and really uh, investing some time training yeah okay okay thank you okay, okay. thank you thank you thank you thank you participants thank for you all, participants all your for questions all, all your questions uh, i would like to uh, invite like sita vijay, vijay kumar vijay kumar to offer an to official offer an word of official thanks to malika prasad madam may i please thank request you. that thank you. Thank please please it all please please it all yeah i just want to say thank you very much um um yeah i just wanted to say thank you very much for inviting me here and um yeah uh, that's that's all i wanted to say hi everyone so we have come to the end of uh, today's talk and discussion uh, i'm i'm so privileged uh, to propose the word of thanks Uh, i thank malika prasad ma'am uh, for talking to us on the topic uh, voice work and performance making so it's been a, a very illuminating and thought provoking talk uh, ma'am also very patiently answered all our uh, queries and uh, doubts uh, thank you so much ma'am uh, now i thank uh, the organizers all the faculty members for uh, you know uh, taking us through these 10 days thank you Uh, and i also thank all the participants for um, actively involving in the discussion so yeah thank you thank you so much so thank you everyone especially thank you malaya prasad for the session and uh, tomorrow we'll have the session of uh, amidesh grover and again we will have two few sessions before uh, beginning the other session that is uh, performance making and artist stuff so once again good day to all good day to many of you thank you everyone bye malika thank you